I, I'm surprised that there are people on this platform who are consequentialists, uh, people on this platform who are hardline materialists, who are not also uh, very, very fascinated in dialectical materialism. Because it, I think it, it just it stands to reason that yes, of course, the very materials themselves shape the way that we fo uh, understand the world and the way that our own conscious processes that, of course, will then in turn shape the actual materials and the conditions themselves in turn. It's 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 a feedback loop. It makes the, the most sense to me rather than all these other ideal uh, ideas where like it has to be just hardline idealism, hardline materialism, stuff like that. It's these these are these are evolutions on uh, philosophical ideas that, that go on and on and on and on kind of thing, right? Okay, so uh, an old philosophical uh, debate that used to take place, doesn't take place as much anymore, is the idea of materialism versus idealism. Idealism uh, is a pretty broad, all-encompassing term in philosophy, but uh, simply put, it's kind of the idea that uh, existence, the, the metaphysical itself, uh, is only possible through uh, the human consciousness, in that the way we perceive the world, as in right now, light is being reflected off of a variety of different things, it's being interpreted through my eyes, the image is being flipped, and then it is being processed by my mind, my mind is then using a, a series of recollections as well as current knowledge, past knowledge to understand and observe the world around me using stimulation, all that kind of stuff. That is forming the actual world around me. That is forming consciousness. So should my mind disappear, everything around me disappears as well. It's kind of a little bit egocentric. Uh, and also plays into a concept known as solipsism in which uh, the self is the only thing that is known to exist. Now, that is in contrast with materialism, which suggests that we, uh, uh, the world would exist without our consciousness. As in, that even if I didn't exist today, you would exist. Uh, if I died today, uh, or I died instantaneously in Roblox or whatever, uh, you would still continue to exist, as would other things that I perceive around me, such as uh, the water in this jug, uh, the uh, urine in one's bladder, uh, or a rock, okay? And the reason that this, uh, you know, different uh, theories about uh, metaphysics and how the world exists, uh, you know, uh, battled for a very long time, uh, is of course because it kind of calls into question what exactly is the world around us. Now, the important thing is materialism, unlike idealism, is capable of being empirically tested through science uh, and that's one of the reasons materialism ended up winning so there's not really a uh, you know a modern day debate between materialism and idealism uh, but there is obviously a, a kind of a quasi debate within uh, the theories of Marxism now we're gonna get to the next uh, thing that we're gonna be talking about today which is the dialectics what is dialectics? I'm not going to pretend to know Hegel, because anyone who pretends to understand Hegel doesn't understand Hegel. That's as far as I'll say it. But dialectics uh, it takes its origin, I believe, in the uh, term dialogue, which of course is a conversation between two individuals, and it's the idea that our perceptions are shaped by the uh, co-conscious perceptions of others around us and how we interact with each other. Um, Marx and Engels, and this one actually, a little bit more credit to Engels, and this one came up with, yeah, we'll say material dialectics. Dialectics. And here we have the kind of combination of all these, the evolution of these philosophies, if you will, in that the very materials, the material conditions of our society and our, our world around us are the things that shape our own consciousness and vice versa. That's the really cool thing, in that if you want to understand parts in history, you can apply something known as historical materialism, uh, and then simply put, you will look at an event in history, and then you will look at the conditions that created that event, such as rather than look at uh, the conquerors uh, the conquests of kings and queens and, and, and uh, dynasties and stuff like that, you would look towards one of those incredible um, uh, events that happened and then look towards what exactly were the material conditions that led to that event and how did those material conditions shape the individuals and then vice versa in this kind of interesting feedback loop. And that should give you, if you apply the philosophy and science of that correctly, a better way of understanding the universe. Now, as far as I've always understood, uh, you know, material dialectics or historical dialectics, um, it's it's never really been a matter of uh, applying a moral framework. As in, I wouldn't use it in order to say what should the world be. Uh, what should what should I do in terms of applying any kind of uh, let's say uh, philosophy uh, and uh, moral system? Like where where do we derive our morals and ethics from? Um, from see, there there my entire credibility as a professor is completely gone there. But um, the reason why I think philosophy kind of exploded uh, in the uh, debate scene, let's just say that, uh, from a very early time, is that if you've got two human beings yelling at each other, 
arguing with each other, a whole bunch of screaming, how exactly do you know who is morally correct? Especially if you're taking stances on things that seem to be uh, on the surface, something that is just very self-evident. Uh, take the very early debate uh, topics that were very popular on uh, Twitch platforms, such as incest. Incest seems like something that's incredibly simple to refute, right? Just be like, ew, gross, no. I mean, like, obviously, uh, it's wrong. It's wrong for a handful of reasons. And then if someone was to ask you, do you know why it's wrong, though? What, where do you get your morals from? Where do you get your moral framework? And then enters in philosophy, where we can say, and if you understand someone's moral framework, you can kind of understand how they're going to apply um, their reasoning to any given situation. And so that's why yesterday, in this debate between Vosh and EJ, they, in my opinion, were speaking about two separate things, two separate topics. And the topic that Vosh was uh, looking to talk about was how exactly do you derive your uh, your moral ethics, your, your framework, uh, from uh, dialectical materialism uh, uh, exclusively, right? Like, what, what exactly is it amongst, within dialectical materialism? Dialectical materialism. Let's see if we can get this one nice and big. That is giving you the good or bad thing. How do we know? So he started applying, uh, oh, sorry, I'm blocking this. He started uh, applying something which he was calling rule utilitarianism. Now, utilitarianism is a, a branch of philosophy in which you are trying to maximize happiness for the most amount of individuals. Probably something that I would find myself pretty closely attuned to. Um, there is something known as average utilitarianism. There's actually a few different versions, but average utilitarianism is basically that you're trying to receive an average amount of happiness and or satisfaction uh, to the broader group through the application of uh, whatever you're trying to uh, codify into this is what we should do, right? Your oughts. Um, whereas uh, rule utilitarianism is you're trying to maximize happiness, but however, in the pursuit of doing so, there will be some individuals who do not receive the ultimate and supreme happiness, the supreme taco happiness, supreme, whatever you want to call it, and there will be a couple at the bottom who uh, obviously do not receive as much happiness in the process, but you're trying to make a system in which it is as equitable and, uh, you know, benefits as many people as possible. And that seems to be a good moral framework. You might remember the two of them uh, from the debate with Sam Cedar and Tim Poole, where Tim Poole was saying, well, you're actually invoking Thanos, you see, because Thanos himself was a, a rule utilitarian. And then Sam Cedar responded with, I don't care. Um, so uh, you, you can also, uh, by the way, philosophy is not codified in stone. Every single one of you uh, is, is able to uh, create uh, your own uh, interpretations and additions to any of this. Uh, for myself, maybe I'm trying to create a new term called uh, fluid utilitarianism, in which uh, my goal is to look and study at what works uh, the best to maximize uh, the optimal uh, human condition for the most amount of people, uh, while at the same time having some kind of, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, homogeneous uh, relationship between the, the earth and, and humanity. I don't know, we're getting very weird now. But I'm just saying, it doesn't have to be as concrete as you are going to have to be, if you've established yourself as a really utilitarian, you are now that for the rest of your life and there is no changing that and you've been codified. These are your axioms, ground them and ground them uh, correctly. But that's, in, in essence, uh, what I believe was taking place yesterday and my quick Coles notes uh, as quickly as I can to, to explain these kind of things. Thanos won that debate? Yes, absolutely. For a friendo. Oh, thanks. For a friendo. That's great. Uh, according to the German socialist and philosopher Karl Vorlander, writing in the earliest 20th century, the moment anyone started to talk to Marx about morality, he would roar with laughter. <laughs> yeah, so that's the thing. Um, dialectical materialism alone doesn't really... Uh, it, 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 in my opinion, gives you a very... Uh, a very advanced compared to previous ways of understanding history, uh, if you're using historical materialism, way of understanding the the why, uh, right? Uh, it doesn't uh, do as much for prescriptions. And in fact, I know for the, you know, the supposed father of, of socialism and, and communism, uh, there, there isn't actually a lot of like utopianism in Marxist writing. There isn't a lot of like, well, uh, everything will be achieved once we uh, establish this, do this, and then all of a sudden we will uh, create, uh, you know, infinite energy out of cold fusion because that'll be uh, just the natural progression of that. A lot of it, like the majority of Marx and Engels' writing is about relationships, the relationship that occurs between uh, different power structures, groups, uh, and uh, of course the relationship between uh, individuals and materials and stuff like that. And then taking all of that, Marx was able to say that under a capitalist system, which eventually in his mind would evolve uh, just naturally into a socialist one, um, under the capitalist system, there's a whole bunch of different things that are going to be uh, controlled and influenced uh, by capital. Uh, and these things include uh, the media, they include politics, they include the state, they even include 
the family and that one is uh that one is highly um Highly controversial as well. It's not as if uh, Marx wanted to abolish uh, the family, by the way. It's that the idea of the nuclear family as it was, he analyzed it to show uh, that it is used to hold up a patriarchal uh, dominating society that serves the interests of capital. That that was kind of the uh, the point. And seeing Luna had previously established that I don't really understand what dialectical materialism is. Well, I haven't gone through the Luna video. Um, and just can I say for the record... The Luna video, isn't it like a year old? I don't understand why this is all the discourse now. Why, why did this all get brought up uh, now out of nowhere? Um, Luna and EJ, in my opinion, are trying to do something which is noble. They're trying to translate uh, all these uh, school curriculum books uh, from Vietnamese to English in order to teach what she had learned growing up. Now, is her lesson specifically going to be a combination of philosophy as well as, uh, I'm sure, a certain degree of indoctrination uh, for, uh, you know, uh, having patriotism and all that kind of stuff involved directly within your nation state. Yes, that, that's going to be a part of it as well. Um, but that in and of itself doesn't mean that it is a thorough and complete understanding of uh, dialectical materialism and all these kind of things. And I also think a lot of people speak out of their ass. And I'm not talking about E.J. and Luna. I'm talking about myself when it comes to these kind of topics. Um, because my understanding of this is only so far as I have read X amount of books. And I always encounter someone who is like, like, I'm not, I, I don't really understand Hegel. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not ashamed to admit that uh, because uh, I've, I found Hegel very dry and <laughs> it took a very long time to read a lot of it. And a lot of uh, ideas of uh, the understanding and the nature of con uh, consciousness um, and how that relates to other people like sometimes it just goes like this like that to me is as a less um important uh scientific theory than a lot of uh what i think marx and engels managed to accomplish with uh the you know the the study and philosophy of dialectical materialism which i think has a lot of utility like i i'm surprised that there are people on this platform who are consequentialists uh people on this platform who are hardline materialists who are not also uh, very, very fascinated in dialectical materialism because it, I think it, it just it stands to reason that yes, of course, the very materials themselves shape the way that we fo uh, understand the world and the way that our own conscious processes that, of course, will then in turn shape the actual materials and the conditions themselves in turn. It's 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 a feedback loop. It makes the the most sense to me rather than all these other ideal uh, ideas where like it has to be just hardline idealism, hardline materialism, stuff like that. It's these these are these are evolutions on. Uh, philosophical ideas that, that go on and on and on and on kind of thing, right? That's that's it. Lance, you'll be proud to know I went out to protest with workers in the Austin DSA. Baby blogger, I am incredibly proud. Wow, good for you. Fuck yeah. That's, uh, that's, 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 that's great shit, you know? Reading Hegel is more like watching a movie that you have to stop and use slow motion time to get the plot. Yeah, and and then you reread it and, and you're like, wait, oh wow, no, that's not what I thought it meant at all. Is it? Or, or is it? I don't know. Yeah. Act and real utilitarianism are idealistic philosophies. We should be clear. Yes, they are. They, they are idealistic philosophies. But, I mean, how how does one set out? So if I'm talking to somebody and we're having a conversation and both of us are like, okay, so here's the best way that I think we should go forward in order to improve our prison system. Right now, our prison system is very, very fucked up. Uh, it is disproportionately, obviously, incarcerating uh, indigenous people in Canada, black people in America. How do we go about fixing this? And so we're going to have a conversation about what we ought to to do. And so if you're having a conversation with someone in what we ought to do in order to improve the prison system, where are you both coming from? That's that's kind of the idea of getting behind what exactly is someone's moral framework. Because if you're just speaking purely on the feels, right? If it's just purely like, well, in my heart, I feel like no one should go to jail. And then you're like, that's true. That's true. But what about the person who may try to murder your mom and will never stop, right? And then you're like, okay, well, maybe just that one person then. And like, okay, cool. Uh, wh where do we go from there then? Because we got we got we got one condition, and that is the person who goes after your mother is worthy of being uh, incarcerated. Is 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 that how we solved the prison system? Did we did we figure that out? Is is that going on? Hey, what up, Lost? Everybody should go follow uh, Lost S I O U X Twitch.tv slash Lost S I O U X uh, because uh, he's going to be doing a, a special subathon charity stream to afford a hospital bed pretty soon. So all of you should go check that out. It's going to be great. Uh, and I agree with uh, Landbrag one hundred percent. That's uh, that's the one thing I. I gotta say that uh, the uh, the patriotic socialists uh, really pissed me off over the the weekend with more of that whole fucking like oh, uh, land back land back is a bourgeois institution in which uh, NGOs are trying to uh, get funding from Jeff Bezos and uh, we we 
don't uh, we don't approve of land back. We approve of land reform." I was like, "Oh, nice. That's very benevolent of you all. That's so so nice of you all to say what what they should and should not do with their own sovereign land. That sounds uh, that sounds good, you know." Do you enjoy the surfs but prefer not to have to use your eyeballs? Many are saying this. Well, we've got the solution for you. It's the Surf Times in podcast form. Available on most major podcasting networks now. If you enjoy it, please consider leaving a good review and feedback because it really helps the show out, apparently, and it's free. Just like the podcast. To our gods, Xander Corvus and Peyton L. Just, we beseech thee to smite down our enemies. To our monarch, Tom Spiker, we are but your humble court jesters, here to amuse you. To our lords, Trevor R., we give thanks for this spit of land for us to eke out this meager existence. To our knights, Merid, Cheryl Alvarez, Ruby Kelly, Ellie Leslie, Alex P., Brandon, Words Greenwood, Nate, That One Guy, Hagbird Celine, Matthew Scarborough, Stellar Vision, Ariane McCarthy, Daniel Sutton, Coulter Smith, Val 9000, Jenna Tall, Quiet185, Anna Loves Riley, Omni, Riley and Anna, Poodlehawk, The Tim Caucus, Multi Mondi, Trevor Yanis, Lemmy101, Anthropophojack, Seren42, Catherine, Radical Maniac, Ramona Costa, Nkosin, Violet Orchard, Sophie Baby, Political Puppy, Andreas Chiringuito, Zach Christensen, Josh Mickelson, Todd Buckingham, and Todd Lajeunesse. We raise our flag in a veil, and we salute you, our friends.